pourquoi j'aurais envie d'autre chose Lady Gaga headlining the Venice Film Festival, a South Korean slow burner and a French movie about male prostitution. You're watching Encore's weekly film show with me, Eve Jackson, and our film critic, Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Eve. How are you doing? Now, we're going to kick off with the Venice Film Festival, which starts this week. What are you looking forward to? Ah, uh, well, this is the 75th edition of this event. Venice is the oldest of the three great European film festivals, along with Cannes and Berlin. Uh, the top prize in Venice is known as the Golden Lion. Guillermo del Toro, who hails from Mexico, is the jury president. And last year, his film, The Shape of Water took the Golden Lion and also won the Best Picture Oscar. Now, trying to guess what's worth seeing before anything's been shown is a fool's errand, but I am curious about the opening night film First Man, directed by Damien Chazelle and starring Ryan Gosling as astronaut Neil Armstrong. Chazelle and Gosling made a very strong impression now with La La Land when that premiered in Venice two years ago, and of course, I am a sucker for the U.S. space program, and I still get choked up at the memory of man landing on the moon. Uh, so I'm very, very eager to see this. OK, well, let's take a look at a key moment in the film First Man. I'm going to step off the land now. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing the remake of A Star Is Born, directed <laughs> by and starring Bradley Cooper, um, opposite uh, Lady Gaga. What are you looking forward to? Uh, well, a film uh, that couldn't be more different than should have been in Cannes, uh, since most film buffs agree that its late director Orson Welles would have wanted it to premiere there, is The Other Side of the Wind, which has been suspended for decades. This elusive project was for many years blocked in Iran, and Welles died before he could finish it. Now, Netflix ended up pursuing the completion, but Cannes prohibited Netflix films from competition if they weren't going to be available to be shown in cinemas, so Netflix didn't send any of its movies to the Cannes Film Festival. The way this argument has gone out into the world beyond France is that the French are somehow backward and unyielding and they refuse to get to the program because everybody knows that streaming a la Netflix is the future, but that is completely mistaken and unfair. What Netflix refuses to recognize is that France has a thriving film industry that employs vast numbers of people and supports filmmaking in many other countries also, and all of that is made possible due to a virtuous circle of which movie theaters are the central pillar. That's because every time somebody buys a movie ticket in France to a French film or a film from anywhere else, roughly 10% of it goes into a fund to make French movies. Follow the Netflix uh, model to its natural conclusion, and before you know it, there will be no more movie theaters, which is something I and the Cannes Film Festival tend to file under uh, a fate worse than death. <laughs> well, two other Netflix um, produced movies that should, could have been um, at Cannes are in Venice, aren't they? Yes, and they sound very, very good. Uh, Alfonso Cuaron, whose film Gravity premiered there five years ago, is back with Roma. All we know is that it's a 70 millimeter black and white autobiographical film set in his native Mexico. And there's also the new Paul Greengrass film, 22 July, about the cold-blooded criminal who opened fire on that date in 2011, killing 77 young people in Norway. Uh, the name Argento has been in the news a lot of late. Well, back in 1977, Asia's father, Dario, made a horror classic called Suspira about an American student attending a European ballet school, which turns out to be a witch's coven. I hate when that happens. Um, it's been remade by fellow Italian Luca Guardandino, who made that same-sex romance, uh, Call Me By Your Name, and he has updated it. It runs two and a half hours and stars Dakota Johnson, Tilda Swinton, and Chloe Grace Moretz. And in the annoying but easy-to-remember title category, we have The Sister Brothers, the first film entirely in English, directed by Francis Jacques Diard, starring Joaquin Phoenix, John C. Reilly, and Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh, okay, well, out this week um, in French cinemas is Burning by Korea. Korea's Lee Changdong. I love this film in Cannes. Me too. Quite a few attendees, particularly the French contingent, thought Burning should have taken the top prize in Cannes. Uh, I think it's terrific. What's it about? Well, it depicts a love triangle adapted from a short story by Haruki Murakami. Uh, there are lots of movies with would-be writers as characters. The act of writing, though, is not terribly cinematic once you dip the pen in the ink or go ding with the computer, uh, sorry, with the, the typewriter keyboard or pound on the, on the computer. 
writer, so properly handled, though, the feats of imagination that writing represents do lend themselves uh, to the screen. Now, how much of what we're watching is really happening and how much of it perhaps only exists in a character's head? It seems real and it is all deliciously deconcerting. So, uh, John Sue is an ordinary fellow from a farm in the country near the uh, 38th parallel, yeah, where loudspeakers blur propaganda from North Korea, and he comes to Seoul to write. At a supermarket promotional stand, he meets a girl, Hammy, who says they went to high school together. For some reason, he doesn't remember this, but they hit it off, and she lives in a very tiny apartment uh, with a pet that is never seen but requires feeding. A handsome and wealthy young man, Ben, enters the picture. He, too, seems to hit it off with the girl, and John Su takes this development very badly. Well, let's take a look. This is from Lee Chang Dong's Burning. Hello,ดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูดูด
automatically inherently interesting. This modest independent film is about a teen from a family in the Chicago suburbs who is taking hormone blockers to stave off the onset of puberty while he, she endeavors to make a decision about where on the spectrum of declared recognizable gender identity they belong. The character goes by the name of J, just the letter J. It is played by Reese Fehrenbacher, who at the time of production was transitioning from being female to being male, and J is 13 or 14. So very interesting to watch. In the weekend the film covers, Jay's sister Lauren shows up with her Iranian boyfriend, and the movie turns into more of an Iranian family get-together than a gender identity quest. Writer-director Anahita Gazavejadeh, who was born in Iran, is obviously blazingly smart, uh, but too little of her intelligence made its way into her film uh, for my taste, but I'm eager to see the next one she makes. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much, and we're going to leave you with a look at They. You can see more movie reviews online at France24.com, or also on Twitter Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for watching. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Okay, so she said that we can do some tests to see if I'm really a girl or not. What kind of tests? Like, she said that I should keep a piece of paper and write down who I am in the morning as soon as I wake up. You did that? Yeah, it's a row. Like, girl, girl, boy, boy, girl. Or I could just write B, G, blank if I don't know. What is my age? Tell me how old I am. The moon go hang. The stars go fly their kites. I want to know my age.